Psalm 73, verse 25. Who am of I in heaven but thee? And there is none upon earth that I desire besides thee. In this psalm, the psalmist, Asaph, relates a great difficulty which existed in his own mind from the consideration of the wicked. He observes in verse 2 and 3, As for me, my feet were almost gone. My steps had well nigh slipped. For I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. In the fourth and following verses, he informs us what in the wicked was his temptation. In the first place, he observed that they were prosperous, and all things went well with them. He then observed their behavior and their prosperity, and the use which they made of it. And that God, notwithstanding such abuse, continued their prosperity. Then he tells us by what means he was helped out of this difficulty, namely by going into the sanctuary, verses 16 and 17, and proceeds to inform us what considerations they were which helped him, namely the consideration of the miserable end of wicked men. However they prosper for the present, yet they come to a woeful end at last, verses 18 and 20. The consideration of the blessed end of the saints, secondly. Although the saints, while they live, may be afflicted, yet they come to a happy end at last, verses 21 to 24. Number three, the consideration that the godly have a much better portion than the wicked, even though they have no other portion but God, is in the text and following verse. Though the wicked are in prosperity and are not in trouble as other men, yet the godly, though in affliction, are in a state infinitely better because they have God for their portion. They need desire nothing else. He that has God hath all. Thus the psalmist professes the sense and apprehension which he had of things. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is none upon earth that I desire besides you. In the verse immediately preceding, the psalmist takes notice how the saints are happy in God, both when they are in this world and also when they are taken into another. They are blessed in God in this world and that he guides them by his counsel. And when he takes them out of it, they are still happy, and that then he receives them to glory. This probably led him in the text to declare that he desired no other portion, either in this world or in that to come, either in heaven or upon earth. So we learn that it is the spirit of a truly godly man to prefer God before all other things, either in heaven or on earth. Number one, a godly man prefers God before anything else in heaven. He prefers God before anything else that actually is in heaven. Every godly man has his heart in heaven. His affections are mainly set on what is to be had there. Heaven is his chosen country and inheritance. He has respect to heaven as a traveler who is in a distant land as to his own country. The traveler can content himself to be in a strange land for a while. But its own native land is preferred by him to all others. Hebrews 11 verse 13. These all died in faith. Not having received the promises, but were persuaded of them and embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. But now they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly. The respect which a godly person has to heaven may be compared to the respect which a child when he is abroad has to his father's house. He can be contented abroad for a little while, but the place to which he desires to return, and in which to dwell is his own home. Heaven is a true saint's father's house. John 14, verse 2, In my Father's house are many mansions. John 20, verse 17, I ascend to my Father and your Father. Now the main reason why the godly man has his heart thus to heaven is because God is there. That is the palace of the Most High. 
It is a place where God is gloriously present, where his love is gloriously manifested, where the godly may be with him, see him as he is, and love, serve, praise, and enjoy him perfectly. If God and Christ were not in heaven, he would not be so earnest in seeking it, nor would he take so much pains in a laborious travel through this wilderness, nor would the consideration that he is going to heaven when he dies be such a comfort to him under toils and afflictions. The martyrs would not undergo cruel sufferings from their persecutors with a cheerful prospect of going to heaven did they not expect to be with Christ and to enjoy God there. They would not with that cheerfulness forsake all their earthly possessions and all their earthly friends, as many thousands of them have done, and wander about in poverty and banishment, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, in hopes of exchanging their earthly for a heavenly inheritance, were it not that they hope to be with their glorious Redeemer and Heavenly Father. The believer's heart is in heaven because his treasure is there. Number two, a godly man prefers God before anything else that might be in heaven. Not only is there nothing actually in heaven which is in his esteem equal with God, but neither is there any of which he can conceive as possible to be there, which by him is esteemed and desired equally with God. Some suppose quite different enjoyments to be in heaven from those which the scriptures teach us. The Mohammedans, for instance, suppose that in heaven are to be enjoyed all manner of sensual delights and pleasures. Many things which Muhammad has feigned are to be the lusts and carnal appetites of men, the most agreeable that he could devise, and with them he flattered his followers. But the true saint could not contrive one more agreeable to his inclination and desires than such as is revealed in the word of God a heaven and enjoying the glorious God and the Lord Jesus Christ. There shall he have all sin taken away and shall be perfectly conformed to God and shall spend an eternity in exalted exercises of love to him and in the enjoyment of his love. If God were not to be enjoyed in heaven, but only vast wealth, immense treasures of silver and gold, great honor of such kind as men obtain in this world, in a fullness of the great essential delights and pleasures, all these things would not make up for the lack of God and Christ and the enjoyment of them there. If it were empty of God, it would indeed be an empty, melancholy place. The godly have been made sensible as to all creature enjoyments that they can satisfy the soul, and therefore nothing will content them but God. Offer a saint what you will, if you deny him God, he will esteem himself miserable. God is the center of his desires, and as long as you keep his soul from his proper center, it will not be at rest. Secondly, it is the temper of a godly man to prefer God before all other things on the earth. The saint prefers that enjoyment of God for which he hopes hereafter to anything in this world. He doesn't look so much at the things which are seen and temporal as at those which are unseen and eternal. 1 Corinthians 4 verse 18 it is but a little of God that the saint enjoys in this world. He has but a little acquaintance with God and enjoys but a little of the manifestations of the divine glory and love. But God has promised to give himself hereafter in full enjoyment, and these promises are more precious to the saint than the most precious earthly jewels. The gospel contains greater treasures in his esteem than the cabinets of princes or the mines of the Indies. Number two, the saints prefer what of God may be obtained in this life before all things in the world. There is a great difference in the present spiritual attainments of the saints. Some attain to much greater acquaintance and communion with God and conformity to him than others. But the highest attainments are very small in comparison with what is future. The saints are capable of making progress in spiritual attainments and they earnestly desire such further attainments. Not contented with those degrees to which they have already attained, they hunger and thirst after righteousness. And as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that they may grow thereby. It is their desire to know more of God, 
to have more of his image and to be enabled more to imitate God and Christ in their walk and conversation. Psalm 27, verse 4. One thing have I desired of the Lord. That will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. To behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. Psalm 42, 1 and 2. As a heart pants after the water brooks, so pants my soul after you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? Psalm 43, 1 and 2. O God, thou art my God, early will I seek thee. My soul thirsts. For thee, my flesh longs for thee in a dry and a thirsty land where no water is, to see your power and your glory, so as I have seen you in the sanctuary. Also Psalm 84, 1-3, and Psalm 130, My soul waits for the Lord more than they that watch for the morning. I say more than they that watch for the morning. Don't. Every saint has not this long a desire after God to the same degree that the psalmist had, yet they are all of the same spirit. They earnestly desire to have more of his presence in their hearts. That this is the temper of the godly in general and not of some particular saints only appears from Isaiah 26, 8, 9, where not any particular saint but the church in general speaks thus, In the way of your judgments, O Lord, have we waited for you. The desire of our soul is to your name and to the remembrance of you. With my soul have I desired you in the night, and with my spirit within me will I seek you early. The saints are not always in the lively exercise of grace, but such a spirit they have, and sometimes they have the sensible exercise of it. They desire God and divine attainments more than all earthly things and seek to be rich in grace more than they do to get earthly riches. They desire the honor which is of God more than that which is of men. John 5, 44. In communion with him more than any earthly pleasures. They are of the same spirit which the apostle expresses in Philippians 3, verse 8. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord and count them but dung, that I may win Christ. The saint prefers what he is already of God before anything in this world. That which was infused into his heart at his conversion is more precious to him than anything which the world can afford. The views which are sometimes given him of the beauty and excellency of God are more precious to him than all the treasures of the wicked. The relation of a child in which he stands to God the union which there is between a soul and Jesus Christ devalues more than the greatest earthly dignity. That image of God which is stamped on a soul devalues more than any earthly ornaments. It is in his esteem better to be adorned with the graces of God's Holy Spirit than to be made to shine in jewels of gold. And the most costly pearls are to be admired for the greatest external beauty. He values the robes of Christ's righteousness which he has on his soul more than the robes of princes. The spiritual pleasures and delights which he sometimes has in God he prefers far below all the pleasures of sin. Psalm 84, verse 10. A day in your courts is better than a thousand. I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. A saint thus prefers God before all other things in this world, as he prefers God before anything else that he possesses in the world. Whatever temporal enjoyments he has, he prefers God to them all. Psalm 16, 5 and 6 The Lord is the portion of mine inheritance and of my cup. You maintain my lot. The lines are fallen to me in pleasant places. Yea, I have a goodly heritage. If he be rich, he chiefly sets his heart on his heavenly riches. He prefers God before any earthly friend and the divine favor before any respect shown him by his fellow creatures. Although inadvertently these have room in his heart, and too much room, yet he reserves the throne for God. 
Luke 14, verse 26. If man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, in his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Number two, he prefers God before any earthly enjoyment of which he has a prospect. The children of men commonly set their hearts more on some earthly happiness for which they hope, and after which they are seeking, than on what they have in present possession. But a godly man prefers God to anything which he has in prospect in this world. He may indeed, through the prevalence of corruption, be for a season carried away with some enjoyment. However, he will again come to himself. This is not the temper of the man, he is of another spirit. Number three, it is the spirit of a godly man to prefer God to any earthly enjoyments of which he can conceive. He not only prefers him to anything which he now possesses, but he sees nothing possessed by any of his fellow creatures so estimable. Could he have as much worldly prosperity as he would? Could he have earthly things just to his mind and agreeable to his inclination? He values the portion which he has in God incomparably more. He prefers Christ to earthly kingdoms. Application Hence we may learn that whatever changes a godly man passes through, he is happy because God, who is unchangeable, is his chosen portion. Though he meet with temporal losses and be deprived of many, yea, of all of his temporal enjoyments, yet God, whom he prefers before all, still remains and cannot be lost. While he stays in this changeable, troublesome world, he is happy because his chosen portion, on which he builds his, his main foundation for happiness, is above the world, and above all changes. And when he goes into another world, still he is happy because that portion yet remains. Whatever he is deprived of, he cannot be deprived of his chief portion. His inheritance remains sure to him. Worldly-minded men find out a way to secure to themselves those earthly enjoyments on which they mainly set their hearts, so that they could not be lost nor impaired while they live. How great would they account the privilege, though other things which they esteem in a less degree were liable to the same uncertainty as they now are. Whereas now those earthly enjoyments on which men chiefly set their hearts are often most fading, but how great is the happiness of those who have chosen the fountain of all good, who prefer him before all things in heaven or on earth, and who can never be deprived of him to all eternity. Number two, let all by thee things examine and try themselves whether they are saints or not. As this which has been exhibited is the spirit of the saints, so it is peculiar to them. None can use the language of the text and say, Whom am I in heaven but you? There is none upon earth that I desire besides you, but the saints. A man's choice is that which determines his state. He that chooses God for his portion and prefers him to all other things as a godly man, for he chooses and worships him as God. To respect him as God is to respect him above all other things. And if any man respect him as his God, his God he is. There is a union and covenant relation between that man and the true God. Every man is as his God is. If you would know what a man is, whether he be a godly man or not, you must inquire what his God is. If the true God be he to whom he is a supreme respect, whom he regards above all, he is doubtless a servant of the true God. But if the man has something else to which he pays a greater respect than to Jehovah, he is not. A godly man. Inquire therefore how it is with you, whether you prefer God before all other things. It may sometimes be a difficulty for persons to determine this to their satisfaction. The ungodly may be deluded with false affections. The godly and dull frames may be at a loss about it. Therefore you may try yourselves as to this manner several ways. If you cannot speak fully to one thing, yet you may perhaps to others. Number one. What is it which chiefly makes you desire to go to heaven when you die? Indeed, some have no greater desire to go to heaven 
They do not care to go to hell, but if they could be saved from that, they would not much concern themselves about heaven. If it be not so with you, but you find that you have a desire after heaven, then inquire what it is for. Is the main reason that you may be with God, have communion with him, and be conformed to him, that you may see God and enjoy him there. Is a consideration which keeps your hearts and your desires and your expectations towards heaven? Number two, if you could avoid death, it might have your free choice. Would you choose to live always in this world without God, rather than in his time to leave the world in order to be with him? If you might live here in earthly prosperity to all eternity, but destitute of the presence of God and communion with him, having no spiritual intercourse between him and your souls, God and you being strangers to each other forever, would you choose this rather than to leave the world in order to dwell in heaven? Is the children of God there to enjoy the glorious privileges of children and a holy and perfect love to God and enjoyment of him to all eternity? Number three, do you prefer Christ to all others as a way to heaven? He who truly chooses God prefers him and each person of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. The Father as his Father, the Son as his Savior, the Holy Ghost as his Sanctifier. Inquire, therefore, not only whether you choose the enjoyment of God in heaven as your highest portion and happiness, but also whether you choose Jesus Christ before all others. Is your way to heaven, and that in a sense of the excellency of Christ, and of the way of salvation by him as being that which is to the glory of Christ, and of sovereign grace, is a way of free grace by the blood and righteousness of the blessed and glorious Redeemer, the most excellent way to life in your esteem. Does it add a value to the heavenly inheritance that it is conferred in this way? Is this far better to you than to be saved by your own righteousness, by any of your own performances, or by any other mediator? Number five, if you might go to heaven in what course you please, would you rather prefer to all others a way of a strict walk with God? They who prefer God as has been represented choose him not only in the end, but in the way. They'd rather be with God than with any other not only when they come to the end of their journey, but also while they are in their pilgrimage. They choose a way of walking with God, though it be a way of labor and care and self-denial, rather than a way of sin, though it be a way of sloth and of gratifying their lusts. Number five, were you to spend your eternity in this world, would you choose rather to live in mean and low circumstances with the gracious presence of God? than to live forever in earthly prosperity without him. Would you rather spend it in holy living and serving and walking with God, and in the enjoyment of the privileges of his children, God often manifesting himself to you as your father, discovering to you his glory and manifesting his love, lifting the light of his countenance upon you? Would you rather choose these things, though in poverty, than to abound in worldly things, than to live in ease and prosperity? Same time being an alien from the commonwealth of Israel. Could you be content to stand in no childlike relation to God, enjoying no gracious intercourse with him, having no right to be acknowledged by him as his children? Or would such a life as this, so in ever so great earthly prosperity, be esteemed by you a miserable life? 